Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at the second video in Deflate series on the basics of intelligent design. Part 1 was covered by Jackson Wheat when he was filling in for me, and I figured, what the hell, I can continue this series. So let's go! Are you familiar with the basics of evolutionary theory? Then you might know that the fossil record actually puts evolution in real trouble. I mean, maybe if you're only passingly familiar with the basics and heard a bunch of creationist apologetics before you learned those basics, but in pretty much any other scenario you'll realize that the fossil record is actually excellent evidence for evolution. You might also know that various theories have been put forward by Darwin's advocates in an attempt to fix that problem. It's not so much that various theories have been put forward, theory here apparently being used in the colloquial sense that in scientific terms would be hypothesis, in an attempt to fix the problem, it's more that as scientists learn more about something it usually brings up a whole new series of questions. Rare indeed is the thing that the more you learn about it the simpler it gets. Color is my go-to example for this because it's really easy to understand just how complicated it can get in a hurry. When you're a child you learn that this is red, this is blue, this is green, etc. As you get older you learn that it's not quite that simple, you learn that this is actually a wavelength of electromagnetic radiation that our brains interpret as the color red, and red objects appear red because they reflect red light. Ok, well why do they reflect red light but not blue light? Well that has to do with the frequency of the electrons in the substance. Electrons vibrate, and if they vibrate at the same frequency as a photon, when that photon interacts with that electron, it will be absorbed and converted into different forms of energy. If the frequencies differ, then it causes a vibration in the electron that results in the emission of another photon, either through the material into the next atom in transmission, or back out the way it came in reflection. The frequency of this re-emitted light is then what interacts with our eyes and brains and is perceived as color, and the ratio of light that is reflected to that which is transmitted determines the opacity of the object. And even this is a pretty big simplification of the process. My point is that science progresses largely by finding inadequacies in previous scientific explanations, and then putting forth hypotheses to make up for those inadequacies, constantly testing them and discarding the ones that fail. So coming up with a bunch of hypotheses in order to account for discrepancies between a theory that is known through many other methods to be correct, and what we observe in the fossil record, where such discrepancies even exist, is actually an indication that scientific progress is being made, not that evolutionists are flailing to keep their sinking theory afloat. In this video I'm going to show you why these attempts not only fail, but even amplify the Darwinian dilemma, so this should be interesting. I wonder if they amplify it in the same way that creationist explanations for things usually have to be taken in isolation, because when taken as a whole they are often mutually exclusive and completely contradictory. Case in point, in this video if he is correct in everything that he says, then creationism is still wrong because he acknowledges the existence of living organisms that existed billions of years ago, and never mentions humans living alongside these early organisms. I'm not sure if he's a young earth creationist, but I think he is. He might be one of those weird old earth ones that try to merge a literal genesis with old ages a la Frank Turek, but he certainly uses a lot of young earth talking points along the way, so I'm pretty sure he is a young earth creationist. Darwin was hoping that as paleontology would progress, later discoveries would produce those forms and vindicate his theory. Yet the exact opposite happened. I skipped most of his opening preamble because he's just rehashing the stuff that Jackson covered in part one, but here he's talking about the existence, or lack thereof, of transitional forms. And he makes the just flat out untrue assertion that not only have we not found transitional forms, but the opposite of finding transitional forms has happened. I'm not sure what he thinks the opposite of finding something is if it's not not finding it. Maybe he thinks that we found that some forms previously thought to be transitional were actually not? I don't know, but things like the land mammal to whale transition, the reptile mammal transition, the transition from small mini horse-like things to modern horses, the transition from early hominid to modern human, and more, have all been found since Darwin's time, and as Jackson pointed out last time, a number of new transitions were discovered in between editions of Darwin's book, such that Darwin was able to use more and more of them as examples each time he published an updated edition. So Darwin was right about that, and as more time goes on and more discoveries are made, we learn time and again that 
yeah, Darwin was right about transitional fossils. And somehow this gets interpreted by creationists as being the exact opposite of what Darwin predicted? Paleontologists have found even more evidence of new animal forms suddenly appearing for the first time out of the blue, as it were, in the era called the Cambrian, without any precursory forms in the preceding geological era. And then it turned out that out of the blue was an inaccurate description of the Cambrian, as a bunch of pre-Cambrian fossils were later discovered, many of which do appear to be the precursors to later Cambrian forms, like Spergina, which apparently is an Ediacaran precursor to trilobites. And of course we have fossils from before the Ediacaran as well, though certainly the record is not as complete from those time periods as we would like. You know, owing to both the nature of the organisms that lived then, with them being much harder to fossilize than, say, a T-Rex, and the fact that any fossils from that time period would have to have lasted for hundreds of millions of years longer than a T-Rex fossil in order for us to find it. It's just a matter of statistics at that point. If all else were equal, we'd be more likely to find a recent fossil than an older one, because the older one is more likely to have been destroyed in the interim. We even have metazoan fossils, that is, proper animals, from before the Ediacaran, demonstrating that animals showed up before either the Avalon Explosion, which is the diversification event that happened during the Ediacaran, or the Cambrian Explosion. This phenomenon is called the Cambrian Explosion, and it completely defies the Darwinian idea of gradual change over time. Only when misrepresented. In actuality, the Cambrian explosion is a rather muddy, non-specific term which doesn't have distinct boundaries in the fossil record. It has been suggested that we rethink the Cambrian explosion as a series of transitional adaptive radiations spanning from roughly 600 million years ago to the end of the Cambrian 480 million years ago. Because the more we learn about the fossil record from that time period, the less it looks like a sudden and distinct explosion of life, and the more it looks like a gradual transition between different forms. I'm not sure how this deflate guy defines sudden, but slowly over the course of more than a hundred million years is definitely not how I would choose to define it. For contrast, the age of the dinosaurs, the Mesozoic, encompassing the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods, lasted for about 186 million years. So this entire event happened in just 66 million fewer years than the entire length of the time that dinosaurs existed. Now, in this video, I'm going to walk you through three of the most important theories that have been proposed in the attempt to plug the hole. And what you'll get to see at the end is that these theories not only don't close that gap, but actually widen it significantly. I mean, yeah, the way you comfortably widen the hole is to regularly plug it and gradually increase the size of the plug that you use. Historically, one of the first hypotheses to be proposed held that intermediate forms to the Cambrian animals must exist somewhere in the fossil record of the Precambrian. And we found them in the Ediacaran. And we found them before the Ediacaran. So that one was successful, end of video? This so-called artifact hypothesis claimed, however... Okay, creationists need to at least do a cursory googling of the term that they're trying to use in order to obfuscate what they're actually talking about. This appears to be another one of those things. You know, like how they will talk about polystrate fossils when the scientific community just refers to upright fossil trees, with polystrate fossils being a creationist term used to make sure that anyone trying to fact check them only gets to creationist sources? This appears to be one of those things, because when I search for artifact hypothesis, all I find are a bunch of articles on anti-evolution sites like Evolution News and the Discovery Institute, and a comparison of the artifact hypothesis versus the grandmother hypothesis for why humans go through menopause. For the curious, the artifact hypothesis is that menopause is an artifact brought about by our increasing life expectancy. Now, maybe I'm wrong, maybe there was historically an hypothesis known as the artifact hypothesis that was about the existence of Precambrian organisms, but which is now obsolete since we have, you know, found a bunch of Precambrian organisms and so no longer need to hypothesize about their existence, but it certainly does look like this is just another one of those creationist invented terms meant to muddy the waters. This so-called artifact hypothesis claimed, however, that the Precambrian layers were buried at the bottom of the ocean, or under the bottom of the ocean, due to the rising and falling of ancient sea levels. Yeah, also due to the fact that plants and animals didn't even begin to show up on dry land until about 500 million years ago for animals and 465 million years ago for plants. So nothing was even on land until halfway through the Cambrian period. Naturally, then, the vast majority of the fossils from all the times leading up to and including the Cambrian were aquatic in nature. I failed to see the problem. 
Just like Darwin, who suggested that the missing fossils would be found in the future, this was basically a scientific theory of the gaps, which did nothing to explain the known evidence as it presents itself to us. Okay, I guess at the time it would have been a guess as to why we hadn't found those fossils as of yet. But since we have found them now, does that not vindicate those guesses rather than invalidate them? And guess is probably the wrong word here. Hypothesis would be more appropriate, I guess. Instead, it explained away the absence of paleontological evidence for Darwinian evolution. Paleontological evidence that we now have. Unless, are you suggesting that paleontologists are saying that they are buried underneath the modern seafloor and that's why we haven't found them? Because that's just wrong. I can kind of see how you got to that misinterpretation, but it is a misinterpretation. So my question here is, is this the historical hypothesis that you are calling the artifact hypothesis? That the Precambrian fossils would be found on the modern seafloor? That's the only way that this makes sense, but I imagine that that one would have been discarded once plate tectonics were discovered and we learn how young the modern seafloor is. Be that as it may, this theory didn't survive for very long anyway. In the 1940s, oil companies got into offshore drilling and started to work their way through miles of seafloor sediments. However, as geologists examined the drill course, the supposed Precambrian fossils were nowhere to be found. Because the modern seafloor is actually relatively young. The oldest section of the seafloor has been dated to about 200 million years, with most of the seafloor being under 150 million years old. This doesn't even get us back to the Cambrian, much less to the Precambrian. If you want to find fossils older than the Cambrian, you have to look in rock that is older than the Cambrian. Like, say, the Ediacara Hills in Australia. You know, that place where all the Ediacaran fossils can be found? Yeah, there. Also, we should note the fact that oil companies assume that evolution is true when figuring out where to dig for oil, because it turns out that assuming a true thing is true works when it comes to figuring out the consequences of that true thing being true. And so the fate of the artifact hypothesis was sealed. In response to its initial defeat, the artifact hypothesis was then adapted to propose that the intermediate animal forms of the Precambrian, which supposedly led to the Cambrian animals, must have been too small or too soft or both to have been preserved. That is definitely a contributing factor as to why there are so few of them. Well, relatively speaking. There are a shit ton of Precambrian fossils, though to be fair he did specify animals, and while there have been some fossils found that are thought to be metazoans from before even the Ediacaran, they are certainly not the norm. However, in the 1980s, spectacular paleontological finds at the site in China called the Maoshen Shan Shales were unearthed from Precambrian sediments. No, those ones are from the middle of the early Cambrian, about 518 million years ago, not the Precambrian. They revealed a wide range of soft-bodied animals which were preserved with astonishing accuracy. Yes, and they are notable precisely because such preservation is rare. The conditions when those fossils were forming were pretty good for preserving soft tissues, where other fossil producing conditions would allow the soft tissues to decompose. This location is comparable to the Burgess Shale in British Columbia. Besides discovering fossilized jellyfish or stomachs, digestive glands and nerve rings of various animals, paleontologists also found fossilized sponges. Yeah, sponges are among the earliest types of animals to evolve. They are very simple animals, not even having a rudimentary nervous system. Exactly the kind of animal that would be predicted by the theory of evolution to have evolved first. So the fact that they can be found in such old rock most definitely supports evolution. Now, you need to understand that the anatomical structure of sponges is extremely delicate, which is why they have been called nature's glasswork. Sure, fine, whatever. I don't even care enough about this to bother checking it. Is your point that scientists once thought that it was impossible for soft tissue to be fossilized, therefore they were wrong here? Because I don't think that it was ever thought that it was impossible, just very difficult. And that still holds true. It is more difficult to fossilize soft tissue than bones. This does not mean that it is impossible and that the finding of such a specimen somehow invalidates evolution. Now I'm skipping ahead a bit, he just marvels at the fact that scientists have been able to find fossils of not only sponges, but also sponge embryos with such great detail that we can even identify the nuclei of fossilized embryonic sponge cells. Cool beans, but not really relevant to the theory of evolution as a whole. What all of this means is that sedimentary rocks of the Precambrian were, in fact, 
perfectly capable of preserving the most delicate organisms. Capable, yes. Perfectly capable, no. As mentioned, despite the fact that soft tissues can be preserved in some circumstances, there are far more circumstances that will lead to the preservation of hard parts like bones and shells. And I'm still struggling to figure out how this is even relevant to the theory of evolution as a whole. There is nothing in the theory of evolution that says the preservation of soft tissues must be impossible. So worst case scenario here, the finding of such fossils would require a rethink of the fossilization process, not evolution. The Darwinist argument that the ancestors of the Cambrian animals must have existed but cannot be recovered due to their softness and smallness is therefore not plausible. Sure, fine. That's a misrepresentation and a half, but I'll grant that. It's not plausible that the ancestors of the Cambrian animals were not found because they are all soft and small. Which makes perfect sense given the fact that we bloody well found the goddamn ancestors of the Cambrian animals, and plants, and others. Did you know there were fractal organisms back then whose body plans would just continuously copy out smaller versions of the initial stem of the organism? Nothing alive today grows that way. That's fucking cool. How about the organisms that had trilateral symmetry instead of bilateral symmetry? That's fucking cool as well. We don't actually know, but they may be one of the ancestors of all the animals, or algae, fungi, or protists. They're freaky and cool, and nothing today is anything like them. That's why another hypothesis was proposed, one that took a radically different approach by claiming that the Precambrian ancestors to the Cambrian animals are actually there in the fossil record, in front of our very eyes, so to speak. I mean, hyperbole aside, that is where we found them, so yeah? This hypothesis refers to fossils of what is called the Vendian fauna, or the Ediacaran fauna, or the fauna of the Ediacaran era. The geological era of the Ediacaran is situated within the Precambrian era. Technically, anything that comes before the Cambrian is in the Precambrian, because that's how prefixes work. You could say that we're in the post-Cambrian now, if you like, and that is technically true. But the reason pre-Cambrian gets a special designation is precisely because the pre-Cambrian fossils were just so difficult to find for so long. So it seemed to scientists of the 1800s that life just suddenly showed up out of nowhere in the Cambrian. But as you've pointed out yourself in this video, even if you did choose the wrong region as an example, we have found pre-Cambrian fossils. Forming its last part, in fact, at the very interface to the Cambrian era in which the sudden explosion of animal forms takes place. It wasn't sudden, it just looked that way based on the information that scientists from more than a century ago had access to. The name of this geological era derives from the Ediacaran Hills in southeastern Australia, where the most significant find of fossils from this time was made. I don't know if most significant is accurate, but it is where the first specimen was identified. Ediacaran fossils can be put into four different categories. First, the sponges, which we've just mentioned a minute ago. Second, fossils that represent a primitive form of mollusks. Mollusks are invertebrate animals that are partly or wholly enclosed in a shell. I don't like how you're dividing this up. I can't find anything that states conclusively that there were only four categories of Ediacaran organisms. Most go out of their way to mention how difficult it is to classify these critters, because they are so very different from anything we're used to today. But yes, primitive mollusks did exist. They were among the first undisputed bilaterians, that is, animals with bilateral symmetry. The primitive mollusk of the Ediacaran that has been found is called Kimberella. Kimberella is a mollusk-like organism, not definitively a mollusk. Its shell was not mineralized. A mineralized shell is one of the key characteristics of the mollusk, so the fact that it had a sort of proto-non-mineralized shell supports the idea that this was a primitive precursor to the mollusks, which you would expect if evolution were true and these guys existed before proper mollusks. A simple animal form that had a shell similar to that of limpets, one that was strong though not hard. Right, not mineralized, a proto-shell for a proto-mollusk. Almost like evolution is a thing. You do realize you're basically describing evolution, right? Third, so-called trace fossils, which aren't fossilized animals, but rather fossilized remains that are believed to go back to animal activity. Well, the word remains tends to be associated with being the actual remains of an animal. Trace fossils are fossils of animal activity, not the animal themselves. Typical trace fossils are, for example, barrows, tracks, or fecal pellets attributed to ancient types of worms. Right, those. That's what trace fossils are. 
The fourth group is made up of the distinctive fossils that were specifically found in the Australian hills and which gave this era its name. This is a weird list. According to this list, the only Ediacaran fossils to ever be discovered are sponges, mollusks, trace fossils, and the specific guys discovered in Australia. So I guess all of the Ediacaran fossils from the Avalon Peninsula in Newfoundland had to either be sponges, mollusks, or just traces? Which, quite frankly, is just plain wrong. Also, I realize that up until this point I've been putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable of Ediacaran, so I will try to correct that from here on out, and no, I am not re-recording all of the times I messed it up. Consider this a test to see who leaves a comment correcting my pronunciation before watching all the way through the video. These are fossils of mostly soft-bodied organisms which are large enough to be seen with the naked eye. I mean, microfossils are a thing. These are fossils that are between 0.001 millimeters and 1 millimeter in size. They're actually the most common type of fossil in existence, and we definitely have microfossils from the Ediacaran and before. The three most well-known forms are Dickinsonia, Sprigina, and Charnia. The hypothesis we're now considering claims that, taken all together, the Ediacaran fossils of these four categories finally solved the Darwinian problem of the Cambrian explosion. There are more categories than that, but yeah, the organisms that existed before the Cambrian appear to be more primitive forms of Cambrian organisms, and so are a pretty damn good solution to the problem of where the Cambrian organisms came from. So let's check out how well this holds up. As far as the Ediacaran sponges are concerned, they do indeed bear some resemblance to some of the sponges that appear in the Cambrian era. Excellent! Score one for evolution. Similarly, Kimberella can be seen as a precursor to certain Cambrian mollusks. Evolution two, creation zero. However, it must be pointed out that this relation is problematic for the following reason. While it is true that Kimberella did have strong body parts, it still lacked the hard shell made of calcium carbonate that is distinctive of the film of mollusks. Yeah, hence it's a more primitive form of a mollusk. If it were a fully developed mollusk, then we couldn't say it was a precursor to the mollusks now, could we? That's not a problem, that is precisely what is predicted by evolutionary theory. If it were clearly the same type of mollusk as a Cambrian mollusk, then it wouldn't answer the question of where mollusks came from, it would just push it back a step, with us expecting to find a more basal form even earlier. As it is, it fits perfectly as a precursor to the Cambrian mollusks. The problem with trace fossils, besides them not being fossils of animals in the first place, is that some of them have actually been shown to represent simple inorganic sedimentary structures or the traces of plant life rather than the result of animal activity. Trace fossils are tricky sometimes, yes. And being plants rather than animals is not a strike against evolution. It would just mean that, you know, it's a plant, not an animal. Plants evolve too, in case you were wondering. So I'm going to be extremely generous and not give the trace fossils point to evolution, even though trace fossils support evolution pretty damn well when you actually look into them, and just call this one a no score for either side. So we're still at evolution 2, creation 0. In addition, the dating of some of these trace fossils puts them into the time period of 1.5 to 1.8 billion years ago, which is way before multicellular life even existed in the first place. You're the one who gave examples of trace fossils that were the result of multicellular life, but that was by no means an exhaustive list of all the types of trace fossils. Stromatolites are an excellent example of a type of trace fossil that is relatively common in the fossil record that is the result of the activity of single-celled organisms. They are mats of usually cyanobacteria that cement themselves to rocks in order to photosynthesize, and over time they grow in layers, leaving behind the structure that they were adhering to as a trace fossil. And the oldest stromatolites date back to about 3.5 billion years ago. Besides which, if I grant what you are saying, saying here, then this means that there are undiscovered complex multicellular organisms that existed 1.5 to 1.8 billion years ago, which would mean that we have even more time for the Cambrian organisms to evolve than we had before, drawing it out, making the process slower and slower. That doesn't help your case. Nevertheless, for reasons I won't elaborate on here, based on an overly optimistic interpretation of the trace fossil evidence, one may grant that these traces might stem from two different types of animals. Eh, not likely for the ones that are over a billion years old. Possibly, but not likely. Thus far, the oldest animals to have been discovered are about 800 million years old. 
However, even with this admission, it is still impossible to define most of the anatomical characteristics of the two animals which are being granted in principle. It's hard to figure out what the oldest animals looked like from their trace fossils, therefore evolution is false? That doesn't quite follow. Not being able to find these ancient animals is not a death blow for evolution, it's an area of research for paleontology. So how about the fourth group, Dickinsonia, Sprigina, and Charnia, the most prominent representatives of the Ediacaran era, which were found in that key site in Australia? Could they plausibly serve as precursors to the Cambrian animals? Yes, but also, even if not, they were most definitely not the only Precambrian animals to be found, they just happened to be some of the most common, which means that they were either massively successful in their time, or they tended to live in environments that were favorable to the production of fossils. Or both. The problem is that establishing a relationship between these three organisms and the Cambrian animals is virtually impossible, and here is why. Because figuring out direct ancestry from nothing but fossils is always nearly impossible, which is why scientists will talk in terms of common ancestors rather than direct ancestors. That's not some secret, that's just how it is. Remember all those unnamed connective dots on evolutionary family trees that creationists are so fond of pretending are representing massive missing links? Yeah, those are actually more along the lines of scientists recognizing that they can't determine direct ancestry with enough certainty to place organisms in those spots for sure, so they are just conservative and assume that since like 99% of species to ever exist are not represented in the fossil record, the odds are that we have not found a direct ancestral connection, but have found a connection where there is a shared common ancestor. Dickinsonia, Sprigina, and Charnia have neither obvious head, mouth, or gut, nor sense organs such as eyes. They don't even have a body marked by bilateral symmetry. Both Dickinsonia and Spergina are mostly bilaterally symmetrical. They're not quite there, but they are pretty close. Almost as though they are an intermediate between asymmetric and bilaterally symmetric. Spergina is likely very closely related to the trilobites. It likely had antenna, and it did have a head segment with what is likely a mouth at the bottom, though it is hard to know for sure, because they're usually preserved in relatively rough sandstone and they are very small. So the combination of the small size of the animal and the large grain size of the sandstone makes it hard to get the small details. But even if I grant all of that, then again, we get to the point where you are saying that because they are not exactly identical to Cambrian organisms, they couldn't have been their precursors. The whole point of evolution is that organisms change over time. The fact that they are different is exactly what we would expect of precursor organisms, by definition. So I'm going to just go ahead and give this point to evolution. So evolution three, creation zero. Yet, the animals showing up in the Cambrian explosion exhibit all of these pretty fundamental anatomical features. You know, because they evolved? In addition, given the nature of those ediacaran organisms, scientists have had a very hard time settling on how to classify them moving them from one taxonomic class to the next and back again. Yeah, they are extremely hard to classify because they hadn't specialized to the point where they fit nicely in with the classification systems that were designed to organize the organisms that are alive today. Almost like they are rather basal, exhibiting some but not all of the defining characteristics of the classifications of animals that arose later. But if these Precambrian organisms can't even be properly classified themselves, the argument that they serve as the precursors to some Cambrian class of animals can never get off the ground, not even in principle. Why? It's the creationist worldview that holds that the world was created with us in mind, and so we'll have a neat and tidy order and classification to it with certain baromens, or whatever creationists call them, in their attempt to figure out what a created kind is. In evolution, the expectation is that nature won't fit into these tidy little boxes that we like, and so we are finding out that the things that existed before the organisms that we designed the boxes to fit don't fit in the boxes that were designed for the much later organisms, as we would expect from evolution, but not from creation. Again, you are actually explaining why evolution is true, but you seem to think that you've called it into question. The difficulty of classifying these organisms is due to the fact that they don't qualify, or at least not unequivocally so, as actual animals, since they lack those fundamental animal features that we just mentioned. Sure. I mean, no, a couple of them are definitely animals, but let's just go with it. We can't classify them. We don't know where they fit. In an evolutionary worldview, this is exciting. It means we've either discovered a new category, or we have more work to do to figure out which category it best fits into. 
But what does this mean for creationism? That God was just fucking with us, making shit up that didn't fit anywhere into the categories that he gave us? You don't see how all this stuff you were discussing actually pretty much demolishes your position, while at worst leaving evolution unscathed, but in reality actually completely supports evolution? That's why the magazine Nature noted that if the Ediacaran fauna were animals, they bore little or no resemblance to any other creatures, either fossil or extant. Others have called these organisms representatives of a new kingdom entirely separate from the animals. Therefore, the most notable organisms of the Ediacaran from the Australian hills are off the table as possible precursors of the Cambrian animals. Well, that first quote you mentioned was pulled from an editorial article that was talking about the controversial and at this point counter-consensus idea that some of the Ediacaran fossils might actually represent terrestrial organisms. They were using hyperbolic language to make it a more interesting read, something not found in the corresponding paper. And in this case, it's more about identifying the rock as being either soil or sandstone than identifying the organisms themselves, though that certainly does play a role. As to the second quote, I'm not sure why you're using a difficult to find book from the 1970s for this, but a book with the same title that was published in the 90s mentioned the possibility that some of the Ediacaran specimens represent new phyla, not necessarily kingdoms, though they also mentioned the distinct possibility that at least a few of them appear to be closely related to the Cambrian organisms, which would push the Cambrian explosion back into the Vendian, which is what the Ediacaran period was called in the 90s. So even back in the 90s, scientists were still coming to the conclusion that the Cambrian explosion was not exclusive to the Cambrian, but was the continuation of a radiation of species that started much earlier, an hypothesis that seems to be gaining traction lately. And notably, one of the possible precursors to the Cambrian animals that was mentioned in this book from the 90s is Spergina, one of the ones that you are calling the most notable of the Ediacaran animals and have taken off the table for some reason. So where does this leave the Darwinian attempt to explain the Cambrian explosion of animal forms by resorting to the Ediacaran fauna? Leaves it in a pretty robust position with a lot of data backing it up. Well, in a best case scenario, we have a total of four pre-Cambrian animals which could serve as the intermediates for the Cambrian ones. Which, if you think about it, is pretty spectacular. I mean, you're wrong, the real number is actually way more than that, but really just think about it. Human civilization has only been around for about 10,000 years, and we have found multiple individual examples of several different species of organism from 600 million years ago. These little guys have lasted 60,000 times longer than the entirety of human civilization. It is amazing that we were able to find them at all. And of course, worth mentioning at this point is that we don't actually need to have found any Precambrian fossils for evolution to work. There are plenty of other well-represented evolutionary transitions in the fossil record, and ignoring the fossil record, there are a bunch of different and independent fields of scientific research that have confirmed evolution all on their own. So we still know from other lines of evidence that evolution happens. It's like if a house burned down, the source of the fire was traced to a particular outlet, but it wasn't determined whether someone threw water on the outlet or whether the fish tank that was above the outlet sprung a leak as the ultimate cause of the fire. Either way, we know that the house burned down and we know that it started at that outlet. You are sitting here saying that because we can't prove definitively that the fish tank sprung a leak, then the ultimate cause of the fire must have been a magic Molotov cocktail that was thrown into the house in a completely different location when the house was already 99% of the way burned down. Yet, even such an overly hopeful best-case scenario, featuring four Precambrian precursors to the Cambrian animals, does literally nothing to solve the problem of the Cambrian explosion, and here is why. Recall from my first video that a wide variety of animals representing as many as 20 different phyla pop up suddenly in the Cambrian era. And recall from Jackson's video responding to that one that by suddenly, you actually mean slowly and gradually over the course of at least 50 million years, but likely extending much farther into the past, potentially doubling the time to 100 million years. Five to 10,000 times longer than the entirety of human civilization has existed is not sudden. It is only sudden when looking at the overall geologic history of the planet, but even then, as we gather more data, it actually looks less and less sudden and more and more gradual. The phyla, as you may remember from that video, constitute the highest or widest categories of biological classification in the animal kingdom, with each exhibiting a unique architecture, organizational blueprint, or structural body plan. 
I thought about skipping that because I assume that most of you are already familiar with this, but I left it in because I find it really weird that he feels the need to quote, of all people, Stephen Meyer for the definition of phyla. It's not a hard definition to find, you don't need to quote a known huckster like Meyer. That won't give you extra cred, if anything it'll knock your cred down a few levels. The animal kingdom is usually organized into 35 different phyla, and the known fossil record features animals representing about 27 of those 35 phyla. Of the 27 phyla featured in the fossil record, 20 make their first and sudden appearance within one single geological time period called the Cambrian Era. I'm just gonna assume that these numbers are correct. Some brief googling leads me to believe that they are close enough to not justify any major pushback. Looking at this number, it should be immediately clear why referencing the Ediacaran fauna does nothing to solve the Darwinian problem of the Cambrian explosion. You do realize that first appeared in the Cambrian does not necessarily mean that that is for sure when they first appeared, right? As creationists are often fond of pointing out, the fossil record is spotty, and it gets spottier the farther back you go. So once again, the fact that we've been able to find that many phyla represented in such an ancient time period is quite amazing in and of itself. But even if the Cambrian is when those 20 phyla first developed, all that means is that they developed sometime in the 50 million years of the Cambrian, 55.6 million years if we're being precise. That fits fine with evolution, but I'm unsure of how the appearance of less than 60% of the major phyla at the same time, followed by the other 40% gradually appearing over the next few hundred million years, fits in with the simultaneous creation of everything. So even if you're right, evolution is still true and creationism is still false. Good job? The most optimistic scenario offers us no more than four possible ediacaran precursors for the Cambrian animal forms. Okay. So 20% of all the Cambrian fossils have precursors that have been found in the Ediacaran, according to your numbers. That's pretty damn good if you ask me. Do you think the fossil record is 100% complete and accurate with every organism to have ever existed being represented? Because it's not. Most organisms and most species of organism are just permanently gone with no hope of us ever learning anything about them. The fact that the record is as complete as it is is actually quite amazing. This means that a total of 16 different phyla are still left utterly unaccounted for. Remember that the 16 unaccounted for animals refer not to animals that are just slightly different from each other, like a cat and a dog for example. No, we're talking about 16 phyla, that is 16 categorically different animal forms, each of which is distinct from the other in the most fundamental ways possible. Okay, but what you have to understand is that the phyla from the time period were not as diverse and distinct as their modern day descendants are. There was nothing like a cat or a dog around in the Cambrian. All chordates, that is everything with a spinal cord, from fish to whales to dogs to cats and yes, even humans, all modern chordates are represented in the Cambrian by things like this funny looking little worm type thingy. So the differences aren't quite as massive as you're making them out to be here. 16 out of 20 are 80%, and if a hypothesis fails to explain 80% of the data, it's probably not a great hypothesis. Well, it's not failing to explain 80% of the data. It's that we actually expect over 90% of the data to just be completely missing, so the fact that 20% of the data from the Cambrian period are represented in the Precambrian is, statistically speaking, pretty damn good. And it gets far worse still for the following reason. You have to understand that the Ediacaran era is the very first era in the history of our planet in which multicellular life appears. Nope. The first multicellular life appeared about 900 million years ago in the Tonian period of the Neoproterozoic era. Before the time of the Ediacaran, the only organisms that inhabited planet Earth for a total of about 3 billion years ever since life began were exclusively single-celled. Then, in the Ediacaran period, which spans no longer than 15 million years, nope! The Ediacaran was 94 million years long, going from 635 million years ago to 541 million years ago. The first sponges, the mollusk-like Kimberella, and other multicellular creatures like Dickinsonia, Sprigina, and Charnia show up on the scene, 
Suddenly and abruptly, without any evidence whatsoever of a gradual change from single-celled life to these new multicellular organisms. I mean, except for the few hundred million years of multicellular life evolving before the Ediacaran. You know, Deflate is one of those weird channels that can sometimes be quite right about the science when he chooses to define things or explain what some scientific term or other means. But then he just gets basic stuff like this completely wrong. This is why the appearance of the Ediacaran fauna is actually referred to by paleontologists as another instance of biological life exploding into all sorts of different forms. And the fact that it seems to form a pretty continuous gradient from the Ediacaran through the Cambrian is why scientists are starting to view these as one long event rather than two short ones. And keep in mind that even the two short ones viewpoint has them each spanning tens of millions of years at least just as it does in the Cambrian era. Sure, the Ediacaran explosion is far smaller than the Cambrian one, as the variety and complexity of the Ediacaran organisms doesn't come close to those of the Cambrian animals. However, when comparing the Ediacaran fauna not to the Cambrian fauna which it precedes, but to the single-celled organisms which it succeeds, the Ediacaran fauna actually represents what has been called a quantum leap in organismal and ecological complexity. Okay, but you do realize that this whole it is succeeding previous simpler organisms that came before the Ediacaran and it preceded later more complex organisms in the Cambrian is evolution, right? That is literally evolution. It started out simple and gradually became more complex and more diverse, with mostly single-celled organisms before the Ediacaran, mostly simple multicellular organisms in the Ediacaran, and slightly more complex organisms in the Cambrian. How do you not see it? This is evolution! It's practically smacking you in the face right now! That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from LF, who says, Wait, creationism explains the origin of the four fundamental forces? Where's my popcorn? Well, LF, creationism explains the origin of everything. It just does so in a completely useless and untestable fashion. So the origin of the four fundamental forces is God. Why are they the way they are? Because that's how God wanted them. How'd he make them that way? I guess he spoke them into existence. What does it mean to speak something into existence? We're not sure. Just don't you dare compare it to a magic spell where you speak magic words to make things happen. It's totally not magic. It's completely different. Thanks for watching. Thanks to this week's PayPal heroes, Aaron, John, and Nathan. And special thanks as always to my patrons, iOS Tilt Bill Gamer, Bryn Pound, Clench Eastwood, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, and all the rest, who are the Ediacaran and fauna that demonstrate the progression from simple to complex that is my channel. If you'd like to be exactly what evolution predicts and yet somehow be thought to be evidence against evolution, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist. Links to social media, all the ways to support the channel, and to my other projects can be found at links.vicerhino.com. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my PO box address is in the description. See you next time!